Uh, we have so much to be grateful for, even with all of the turmoil and global tensions and stuff going on. Uh, it's a great country to to live in, especially with our. There we go. Okay, so we're live. All right, guys. So let's go ahead and uh, jump in, get started. Welcome, uh, Market Pulse members. And uh, before we get into any of our uh, highlights or news articles and some of the topics that I've picked, I've got to jump in and go through our disclaimer. So let's jump in and grab that, and then we will get started here in just a moment. Thank you. Okay, that should do it. All right. And obviously, like and subscribe, guys, if you aren't on my channel already. I also send out a uh, news article that you guys should be getting in your emails. If you're not, uh, you can look up my sub stack. It's uh, Market Pulse with Matt. And uh, I do weekly updates on the news. And we've got a lot to cover uh, today. And let me just give you like the highlight topics. So um, as a lot of you know, legendary Charlie Munger uh, passed away almost 100 years old. Uh, and I'm going to make sure that we take some time to pay tribute to him. Uh, we're going to talk about the VIX and why it's important right now. The VIX is giving us information about the market that I think is uh, quite revealing for 2024. Uh, it might also indicate some of the things, what's going to be happening around interest rates. We're going to talk about M2. We're going to talk about uh, the Warren Buffett indicator, the yield curve. Uh, but let's go ahead and jump right in. I typically uh, like to show you guys our trades, and I'm actually going to save that towards the end. I've changed kind of the order of what we're doing here. So the last thing that we're going to do is our gold and S&P 500 review, which is one of my favorite parts of this uh, podcast is to go over like what is the market likely positioned to do into next week, specifically the S&P 500, and what is gold doing right now because I like gold. I like putting our members in a strong position uh, when it comes to owning real assets versus these like, you know, Fagazi paper slips, uh, whether it's companies or fiat currency. Gold is real and it's something that I like. So that's one of the reasons I go over it. And I think you're going to be, I know we missed uh, last Friday because of the Thanksgiving holiday, but I think you're going to be shocked at how well our support and resistance levels that even we set up two weeks ago have held up. Uh, both in gold and on the S&P. But uh, as we get started here, I just wanted to pull up some fun clips. I thought that you guys would enjoy this. I found a bunch of fun clips of Charlie Munger and some of the things that he just, you know, he's he's kind of this cute, nerdy old dude. Uh, brilliant, by the way, probably one of the, the most brilliant value investors, uh, you know, I wouldn't even say second to, I'd say hand in hand with Warren Buffett. And a lot of people know the Warren Buffett name, but really behind it was Charlie Munger and his brilliance. Um, but we're not going to highlight any of those videos or any of the things he said that were brilliant. I really want to just shine a light on his personality and his humor. So I thought I'd put some clips together of like some of his top things. So let's go ahead and uh, share that. <laughs> Charlie. But those of you who are about to enter business school or who are there, I recommend you learn to do it our way, but at least until you're out of school, you have to pretend to do it their way. <laughs> people don't seem to get that point. you have any idea why, Charlie? <laughs> Warren, if people weren't so often wrong, we wouldn't be so rich. No. <laughs> yeah, I think you would understand any presentation using the word EBITDA, if every time you saw that word, you just substituted the phrase bullshit earnings. Yeah, it's not that much fun to uh, buy a business where you really hope this sucker liquidates before it goes broke. I like cryptocurrencies a lot less than you do. <laughs> to me, it's just dementia. Professional traders that go into trading cryptocurrencies, it's just disgusting. It's like, Somebody else is trading turds and you decide I can't be left out. 
He obviously had a uh, bias towards crypto, if you can't tell. But this is Charlie Munger's value. You, like you really see his value position uh, when investing, and it reflects in a lot of his uh, funny comments. I don't think there are good arguments against my position. I think the people that oppose my position are idiots. <laughs> and, and so, no, I'm. A- I'm optimistic about life. If I can be optimistic when I'm nearly dead, surely the rest of you can handle a little inflation. <laughs> and of course, that's the other advice. The best way to get what you want in life is to, to deserve what you want. How could it be otherwise? It's not crazy enough so that the world is looking for a lot of undeserving people to reward. A director getting $150,000 a year from a company who needs it is not an independent director. They're looking for chihuahuas and, 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 and not great Danes. And, yeah. Yeah. and I hope I'm not insulting any of my friends that are on comp committees. <laughs> You're insulting the dogs. No. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody wants fiscal virtue, but not quite yet. They're like that guy who felt that way about sex. Yeah. He's willing to give it up, but not quite yet. Well, <laughs> you don't want to be like the motion picture executive in California. And they said the funeral was so large because everybody wanted to make sure he was dead. It was investment banker aided fraud. Now, not exactly novel. <laughs> that does not mean we approve of every buyback at all, though. I mean, we've seen. No, no, no. Yeah. I think some people just buy it to keep the stock up, and that, of course, is insane and immoral. But apart from that, it's fine. <laughs> and yet, it's perfectly obvious, at least to me. That to say that derivative accounting in America is a sewer is an insult to sewage. <laughs> I've listened to so many nonsensical cost of capital discussions that I've never heard an intelligent one. Yeah. Charlie's big on lowering expectations. Absolutely. <laughs> That's the way I got married. <laughs> My wife lowered her ex- expectations. <laughs> sure, there are a lot of things in life way more important than wealth. All that said, some people do get confused. I play golf with a man, and he says, what good is health? You can't buy money with it. <laughs> well, there are a whole lot of things I don't think about. And one of them is companies that are losing two or three billion dollars a year and going public. And the people who invented this crypto crapo, sometimes I call it crypto crapo, and sometimes I call it, well, crypto sh- <laughs> It's just <laughs> ridiculous that anybody would buy this stuff. It, is, it isn't even slightly stupid, it's massively stupid. And in accounting, you can do things like they do in Italy when they have trouble with the mail. You know, it piles up and irritates the postal employees. They just throw away a few carloads, and then everything flows smoothly (laughs) thereafter. That happened in some unnamed international company, country. (laughs) Yeah, Italy. (laughs) The general system for money management requires people to pretend that they can do something that they can't do and to pretend to like it when they really don't. I think that's a terrible way to spend your life, but it's very well paid. You are mixing something which is wretched and irrational and has bad consequences with something that uh, has very good consequences. But you know, if you mix raisins with turds, they're still turds. Really likes his That's why they have me write the annual report. (laughs) Well, I can't give you a formulaic approach because I don't use one. If you want a formula, you should go back to graduate school. They'll they'll give you lots of formulas that won't work. As Samuel Johnson said famously, I can give you an argument, but I can't give you an understanding. It's extraordinary how resistant some people are learning anything. He the answer is no, the board at Lubbers Hall did not breach its duty because we were not going to participate in the transaction if they didn't do it our way. Has anybody else got an easy question? <laughs> it's not that great a business as a business, casualty insurance. It's a tough game. There are temptations to be stupid in it. It's like banking. And, but competency is a relative, is a relative concept. And what a lot of us need, including the one speaking, what I needed to get ahead was to compete, compete against idiots. And luckily, there's a large supply. 
<laughs> I don't like multitasking. I see these people doing three things at once, and I think, God, what a terrible way that is to think. Warren reminds me, once I asked a man who just left a large investment bank, and I said, how does your firm make its money? He said, off the top, off the bottom, off both sides and in the middle. <laughs> well, I would rather throw a viper down my shirt front than hire a compensation consultant. Um, I think I've offended enough people. Right. <laughs> There's two or three in the balcony. <laughs> All right, guys. Charlie Munger passed away this week, died 99 years old. Uh, probably one of the greatest financial guru contributors uh, in this century. Uh, second, I would say hand in hand with Warren Buffett should be a name that we recognize and hold in that same regard. Um Definitely will be missed. And you can see the lighter side. Like Charlie did definitely had a dry sense of humor, but was brilliant uh, when it came to the market. So you will you will be missed, Charlie. So next up, guys, I want to bring up the VIX. And I want to share with you some insight that I have on the VIX and why I'm like sharing this. So let's just bring up a chart really quick. I want to share with you. So here's our VIX chart. And this is a really interesting chart. So you can see this goes back uh, over a year. So I, I brought in data for, from about 13 months. And you can see where the VIX came in at the top and where the VIX uh, is currently. And for those of you who don't know what the VIX is, it's a volatility index of the S&P 500. And the way that people describe the VIX is when the VIX is low, the market is settled. There's there's not a whole lot of volatility. Therefore, the likelihood of a drop in the market is low. But when there's a spike in volatility, there's typically a reaction uh, towards the downside or a bearish market. In fact, there are strategies that through COVID were brilliant just using the VIX, where like if the VIX went over a certain number, you shorted the market. If the VIX went under a certain number, you bought. And you could, you know, uh, pull profits out of the market basically on a strategy like this. Well, I'm not here to talk about any of the uh, strategies, so to speak, when it comes to the VIX, but I want to talk to you about what it means to have the VIX at an all time low. And you can see over the last year what's going on. So when I describe this and you look at this chart, right now we're at uh, 12.95 on the VIX. And you can see clear back into last year, we were at 34. So there's been almost a three times decrease in the volatility on the S&P 500. And what that means is that the markets are getting secure. They're, there's not a lot of uncertainty in the market. And uh, the stability or the perception of the market is actually relatively good. And let me tell you what's triggering this right now. And we'll talk about some of these data points as we go on. But uh, this week, we just had PCE come in and PCE came in as expected. And so there was no shake in the market, which actually targets or it foreshadows a likelihood of next year having rate decreases. And so the likelihood of us being able to kind of take our foot off the gas in terms of rate increases, I think is uh, is showing a increase in kind of this soft landing. Uh, but we are kind of priced, the way I would like to say it is we are priced to perfection right now in the market. Like everything is going as planned, but it's almost this eerie silence in a way. And so when I see the VIX this low, I see I see like great for the markets. You know, we're going to see more bullish appetite. Uh, this is a good sign that inflation is tamed. We're seeing data points that are showing that. However, there is a lot of looming data that we're going to uh, be dealing with in 2024 that I think is actually going to shake this a little bit. And we'll probably see a jump in the VIX because of that. We'll probably see a drop in some of the markets, uh, obviously in specific areas. Uh, not every market is the same. And uh, I think what you're going to see going into 2024, especially being an election year, is much more high volatility. But this is great news for the month of December. Uh, Black Friday 
Cyber Monday came in. I don't know if I'm actually, do I have anything on this? Let me check this real quick. I might have an article that I'll bring up on this. But for the most part, those came in uh, at high yields. In fact, I don't have it. But let me kind of give you the data over Cyber Monday, Black Friday. Uh, it was reported that spending was over 7% compared to year over year. So compared to last year. So for those of you who think or thought like, Black Friday was awful or, you know, the crowds didn't seem high or, you know, whatever. You can make up whatever story you want. The reality is maybe people weren't spending in the stores, but they were spending overall. And I'll give you another data point that I found over this week uh, that wasn't just the good news on spending, because good news on spending always means, you know, good news for the economy. But there was also this unique piece of data that I saw that the debt used for spending was higher than ever before also. And so we're kind of dealing with this, okay, we're we're spending, but where's the money coming from? And are, are people over leveraging their debt? Are they pushing their debt to a place that it's never been? And the answer is yes. Credit card debt, uh, consumer debt, household debt is at an all-time high. And the debt uh, percentage used for gifts this year was higher than it's been over the last uh, few years. So uh, all those things I think are worth considering. But there's kind of your look at the VIX, understanding why the VIX is important. And I would be watching this really close because if you start to see the VIX start to jump back up, especially into like the 16 levels, that's a pretty strong sign that we're either going sideways or bearish uh, in the market, uh, specifically on the S&P 500. So there's our VIX data. Um, let's talk, I want to share with you. So there's all this good data that's coming out right now. And I want to share with you some of the, the topics that we're going to be hearing a lot more about next year, uh, specifically with an election coming in. So we have a presidential election coming in uh, next year, and the topics are generally the ones that concern you, you know, my listeners, the general public the most. And one of the topics that has not been a topic for probably the last decade is fiscal responsibility as we've seen inflation really impact the average day citizen. And we're dealing with this kind of like tug of war of whether we should go forward, you know, printing more money, letting the government just hand out checks and stimulus, because it feels like the general public, when they get it, they love it. But then when we have to deal with a year, two years, three years later, we hate it. And that will likely be a very strong conversation that we're talking about during the next election. But I want to show you, Ray Dalio is one of my uh, mentors, I would say. Uh, it's one of the individuals that I follow the most. I mean, Charlie Munger, obviously one of my great heroes, Warren Buffett. But Elon, or not Elon, excuse me, just throw out Elon Musk just to get some clicks. No. So Ray Dalio was one of the largest hedge fund managers on the planet. In fact, managed the largest hedge fund in the world and learned lessons the hard way. Uh, this, this gentleman started a fund and his first fund actually failed because he predicted the market in the wrong way, didn't quite understand how uh, the monetary or money system worked as well as he does now, and then became obsessed with micro and macroeconomics. And so I hold him in a very high regard He's done a lot of uh, philanthropic work now that he's kind of retired. And the way that he, I've heard him say it he's, is he's doing this work to give back. He's really doing these downloads and these books and these apps, these interviews really to give back in hopes that we learn from our past in hopes that we we actually grab on to this information and make the future world better uh, because we are dealing with some problems. And so I want to share with you this video. We're going to call it the debt crisis inflection point where Ray Dalio is speaking and he's going to talk to us about this inflection point that happened uh, with the dollar and how we're at this really critical point as a country to tame our debt and our spending, or we're going to go into this kind of debt spiral. And he's kind of saying like, now is that moment. Now is the time. And so I want you to hear from him on this uh, and then I'll make some light comments afterwards. So let's bring this up. And this was an interview done on uh, CNBC to give these guys credit. 
Ray, back in September, you said that the United States, you think, will be facing a debt crisis. Uh, yields have changed pretty dramatically just in the last week or so. You still think that that's the case? Uh, yeah. It's a uh, look. Uh, you have um, you have a change of 50, 25 basis points and so on. Let's let's just go back to the basics and, and the big picture. Um, First of all, um, let's take the bond yield. The bond yield, it, roughly speaking, has got to be um, about what we determine the expected inflation rate will be over um, the period of time. And that, that's, there's, of course, there's a question about that. That number it probably is settling into the vicinity of 3 3 3.5%. That's the right number. There has to be, um, above that, a real interest rate. In other words, uh, for those who are creating, holding debt, debt assets, they have to receive a return above the inflation rate by something probably in the vicinity of one and a half, two percent. So that is going to get you in the vicinity of four and a half, five percent interest rates. It, and you're seeing the movement around that level. Then there's the big question of the supply demand for bonds. All right, I just want to pause what Ray said because you know for it took me years to understand this language. It took me years to like understand this training. But what Ray essentially has said is that bonds, the T bond is a reflection of our projected inflation over those years. So right now the 30 year, if you look at the top here, this is why they have this chart. The 30 year T bond is positioned at 4.5%. Now what he's saying is that the market analysts have already factored in about a three and a half percent inflation rate on that 30 years. Now, in order for these people to make money, they have to make, like he said, you know, one, one and a quarter, one and a half percent. And so that's why you're seeing the current 30 year rate at about four and a half percent. And so when you look at for any of you who are like, why do we look at the T-bond? Why is this data important if I'm not buying it? Why is it constantly being talked about right now? And the reason is, is because it's a reflection of where we think inflation is going to be. And so this is this is like the segue of uh, Ray Dalio setting you up on why we're at this massive inflection point in this country that we could go into a debt spiral where the dollar devalues, by the way, the dollar is already devalued, but the dollar devaluation will happen on a much faster and radical scale where that, that increase will go up at a percentage that we're actually not used to. And that comes in the form of inflation, definitely, but also uh, kind of a global competitiveness of the dollar. So like what I can get for my dollar versus any other currency also starts to shift uh, with this inflection point. So just keep listening to this, but this is where this gets really important. And guys, I know, I, I, I know I'm trying to set your listening up, but this, this eight minutes with Ray is probably, if you could just really focus in, take notes and pay attention is probably one of the most valuable things that have happened and have been spoken about in the last two weeks. So I really want to make sure that you catch the rest of this. In other words, uh, the government produces a certain amount of bonds that are in light of and in, in size of that is equivalent of roughly the size of the deficit. That means they're going to have to sell a lot of bonds. OK, and then we look at who are the buyers of those bonds and do they have an adequate appetite? Uh, and that's a big risk because we have uh, uh, many who own those bonds have had losses in that. That's not just banks. That is central banks. That is Japanese investors and so on. And so there's a supply demand issue. You'll have these wiggles around there, but those are the fundamentals that will drive it. So as we look forward, we have a, we have a debt problem because you can't keep adding to debt faster than you add to income without that problem. So we're seeing the need for the rise in real interest rates so that the creditor gets a, uh, an adequate return at the same time as we have a supply demand balance. So that's how it looks to me. What's happening in the economy is that a lot of money was sent out um, in the form of checks and the like. 
and went out to a lot of people. And, um, and so there was the household sector uh, did well because the government sector did poorly. They got themselves in deeper debt intentionally so that the household sector and the business sector could be better off. And then there's the rise in interest rates. What that happens from that is that that savings of money gradually goes down and also the uh, debt maturities as they, they roll forward gradually go up and create a squeeze. So there's, however, the, because the unemployment rate is relatively low and because the compensation levels have been relatively high because of that set of circumstances, the household sector's income has been good. So you have a sector in uh, the household sector, hence the economy as a whole, and I'll include, include the business sector in that, in which, by and large, the financial transfer of wealth from the government as it gave, got in debt and gave it to the public sector, uh, gave right. it to the private sector, right. Right. that allowed that, that to happen. So that is a formula in a punchline. I'm sorry I'm taking too long. Um, that is a, f a formula for a gradually weakening economy, not a big break in the economy, a slowing of that economy. Right. I think that's what we're seeing. And as a result of that, that's what you're seeing in the bond market as there's a bit of a uh, sl uh, sl uh, but, easing but, but play, in, within but that range. Play this out, play, play this out a, a little bit longer, uh, which is to say, where do you think interest rates are a year from now, you know, on a very just straight up basis? But then even longer than that, you're talking about the debt problem that we have in this country. That's becoming a, a main feature of, of debate and, and a topic, of course, in, in, in the presidential election and what's going to happen uh, come November 2024 uh, and beyond. Uh, as far as the question of where uh, the rates are, um, I think that the, uh, most likely, I think the rate structure is going to um, be staying at its level, perhaps uh, slightly less, but there's a range of uncertainty around that having to do with the supply-demand question. We're now at a period of time where the supply of bonds to be sold will be hit, start hitting the market, and now we have to see the demand issues of that, and that'll be around there. I, I think that probably in the vicinity of, you know, I would say somewhere in the vicinity of relatively flat. I don't think there's going to be uh, any important change in the Fed uh, policy uh, other than um, maybe a slight easing as the economy slows down. I think the thing to realize is that there, uh, the economy will likely weaken. So in other words, its growth rate going to something close to zero, plus, plus or minus, maybe 1%. And with that, that that exerts a slight downward pressure on interest rates. At the same time, the supply issue becomes an important issue. Uh, the second part of your question, I forgot the second part. What was that? Well, just uh, how the much, longer you know, term debt, the longer the lo term, the longer debt term issue? damage of, of the longer term damage of having these uh, uh, of having this enormous amount of debt. Obviously, that's playing into the political debate. But if, if one, I mean, it sounds to it, me you're it, also arguing that if we're going to have a, a soft landing, that maybe people are going to feel more comfortable holding as much debt as we do and that the rates are not going to you know, blow through the roof? No, I think we're talking about the short term uh, as very distinct from the longer term. Um, the short term we just talked about. The longer term is that we are at a point in which we are borrowing money to pay debt service. And there is a process by which when, when you keep having debt growth faster than income growth, then that means that you have debt service encroaching on your spending. It's the same for the government as it is for us. And as that happens, and you want to keep spending at the same level, there is the need to get more and more into debt. And the way that works, it's like a, it, it, it accelerates. We are at the point of that acceleration, which creates the supply-demand problem. And it's made worse by the other issues that we're talking about. I, uh, the internal political issue, the internal social conflict issue uh, there is something that is affecting foreign demand for, for bonds. For about 40 percent of our debt uh, is sold to foreigners. And so there is a concern of the American politics, 
of, 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 of the controlling of this debt crisis and these types of things. So we come back to the same basic question. How good, how strong are we going to be? When we talk about strong, what, what I mean is also economically strong. And economically strong means financially strong. That means it's just a basic thing. Financial, financially strong means do you earn more than you spend? And do you have a good income statement as a country? Do we have a good income statement? And do we have a good balance sheet? More assets than we have liabilities. The worse that gets, the more we are going to have that long-term problem. And it's just, you can see it in the numbers. It's just a matter of numbers. We are near that inflection point. All right, so Ray Dalio on the inflection point. And this was, uh, I would have covered this last week had we not had the holidays, but this uh, came out actually between our last uh, session that we had, guys. So this is not something I pulled out of like July or May. This is Ray Dalio speaking on what's happening right now. And when he talks about like the data points are showing this, I want to bring up one of the data points that's very clearly showing exactly what I'm talking about. And this is what we call M2. And I want to share with you something I did with M2. And I drew some of my own drawings on here. I took the curve of M2 since 1995. And I'm actually shocked that I haven't seen anyone do this illustration before. Because uh, predictive models and trends are typically how we uh, track certain, certain charts, certain products, certain asset classes. Uh, especially when you have a bubble, right? And we had a bubble. It was called COVID. And COVID, we injected, to give you guys an idea what this is, this is M2 is the United States money supply. And so it's the amount of cash that is out in the uh, market. And the way that we constrict or expand M2 is typically through interest rates. The lower the rates, the more borrowing that can happen, the more money that gets out into the system. And so this is the formula that the feds use to tame inflation. It's why they use interest rates as their biggest lever. When you bring rates up, you start to shrink money supply. And as long as we're not injecting and printing a bunch of cash, this will actually happen. And so you can kind of see uh, on this chart, Clearly, the spike from COVID, right? We were definitely in an exponential curve. And this is one of the things Ray Dalio was talking about is like, we we have a problem here. Like, we have an issue spending money and we just spent a ton. And now we're taking it from an economic standpoint in a way. We are kind of sucking it out of the, the hands of the middle class. We're sucking it out of the hands of the poor. And frankly, this is a, a massive issue uh, for a lot of people. Now, what I did is I drew this red curve and you can see that to get just back into the exponential curve that we had before the pandemic, we would have to go completely sideways. We would have to keep rates where they're at, locked in, like flatlined. We would have to keep unemployment exactly where it's at. We'd have to keep GDP right where it's at. Everything would have to stay exactly where it's at. And if that happened, we it would take us until May of 2025. So when people chime in like Ray Dalio and they say things like, you know, I think it's going to go sideways, but as the economy starts to constrict and, you know, basically what he's saying, he didn't want to say the word, but as we go into a recession, possibly in the next year, high likelihood, what's going to happen is uh, the feds will be tempted to lower rates. But if you look at this chart to get our M2 kind of back in line so we don't hit this inflection point in this debt spiral, we're going to have to do some taming around that until about May 2025. And that's not 2024. And so I think this makes a strong argument, and I think it echoes what Ray Dalio was saying. Rates are going to stay high where they're at for much longer than we anticipated, and it would not be a surprise to me. Like everything is priced to perfection. And the only way that we're going to see a rate drop is if things just go perfectly smooth and, and through 2024. If we start to see any bump in inflation again, there may even be rate hikes. And there's been a lot of analysts that have been predicting a 
uh, drop in inflation and then a secondary rise, almost like an earthquake that has an aftershock, right? You have the major impact of it and then uh, the aftershock after. Hey, give me just two seconds here, guys. I've got... I've got to plug in my battery. I'm noticed. I just got a warning that my battery is going out. So give me two seconds. All right, there we go. Sorry about that. I I had it plugged in, but my uh, the charger behind me, I guess, had fallen out of the socket. So. Uh, kind of wrapping things up on this M2, I don't think I need to show the illustration or the chart again, but really what I'm saying about M2 is if we we're to get back into that curve, which I don't like the curve as it is, to be in an exponential curve on any M2 printing, uh, money supply, unless GDP is doing that, unless somehow through technology, innovation, we're going to somehow uh, cut off this radical exponential curve in spending that we've been uh, experiencing uh, that's bad enough. But for us to be out of that curve, to have us just completely break out like you saw on that chart, and then to go, okay, we've got to get us back into at least what I would call normal territory. Uh, May of 2025 is kind of a shocking reveal. And I just don't, I study data enough to know that it's going to be, it's either we're going to break, which is one of Ray Dalio's big concerns, or we're going to do what's right we're going to get a fiscally responsible president in the next election. We're going to see lots of cuts in government spending. Don't expect government handouts for a while. And uh, things will be sideways. So if you don't like where things are right now, you don't like rates with where they're at, maybe you're in real estate or something that impacts your business around rates, I would not anticipate seeing a change in this for at least uh, it could be this time next year that we might see a decrease. Now, Obviously, the reason I do this every week is these things change week to week. Um, and so obviously, I'll keep you guys updated, but that's how it looks now. It was looking like we would gonna it was looking like we would see a rate decrease at like mid 2024. but with the new data that's coming out, I'm not seeing that. I would be very surprised to see a rate drop. Uh, based on some of the inf inflation points, because we're still not at 2% with inflation, which is about where we want it to be. All right, so that that was a fun uh, tangential conversation. I want to echo, so we did a, a nice highlight on Charlie Munger. And as you know, Warren Buffett was one of Charlie's uh, closest teammates, partners, and contributors to his success and I think it's appropriate and, you know, it's not, it's probably just coincidental that we're going to be talking about this, but I want to bring up the Warren Buffett indicator because um, we're dealing with something where it's like, okay, now looking at the market, looking at what happened, looking at M2, this like price to perfection VIX, what's going on with value? And you heard Charlie Munger in some of his quotes where he was like, you know, he, he used a lot of sewer and uh, crap language, you know, so to speak. He compared things he didn't like to uh, fecal matter a lot, as you noticed. And what was interesting about that or, or what I thought was entertaining about that is if you don't know Charlie, you might have been offended. You know, a lot of people, including myself, made a ton of money when crypto came out. But the play was not a play like Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger play, and that's value trading. And so the Warren Buffett indicator is really a value index. And I think it's important to understand that. It does not take into account sentiment. It does not take into account M2. It does not take into account uh, inflation. All it takes into account is this formula that you can see here. So just follow this with me. The Buffett indicator is the total US stock market over annualized GDP. And so basically what we're taking is market cap, the entire market cap. This is like S&P 500 included. We take the total market cap, all cash that's in the stock market, that dollar amount, which right now is $44 trillion. And then we divide it by what's our annual GDP. How much cash are we creating from this total investment? And right now, 
when you divide the two, you get at 160%, which historically is insanely overvalued. Insanely. And so I want to show you this chart, which will really highlight this well. Here's the actual indicator, and I can put this in a full screen. But here's the, the current indicator as of today. And you can see on the far, far right, well, actually, this is the 31st of October. But on the far, far right, oh, yeah, that's is that today? Today's the first. So as of yesterday, excuse me. But as you can see, and I'll explain for just our listener audience, there's the way that this chart breaks things out is in two standard deviations. And so zero is the historic trend line. A standard deviation above that uh, is represented by one. And then two standard deviations is a two. And so this is how we can kind of see if, like, is the market based on the Warren Buff Buffett indicator overbought or oversold, overvalued or undervalued, right? And that's why Warren Buffett created this indicator was to find stocks uh, certain businesses, asset classes that were undervalued because he was a value trader. He was a long-term trader, not a short-term trader. And so this is a really valuable tool for those of you looking into the future of like, is now a good time to like, if I'm sitting on a bunch of cash, is now a good time to throw it all in? And uh, based on this, I would say probably not, but let's go and look at it. So you can see we're right above that first standard deviation line right now, where we're sitting at 1.06. Now, are we in a better position than we were back in August of 2021? Yes. We had so much cash in the market, so much uh, extra funny money that got printed, handed to the public, businesses got all these bailouts, and a lot of that money went into the market. And so you can see that as the spike went into this extremely overvalued, in fact, the most overvalued the market ever experienced. Then what happened? And I'll show you actually what happened later when we pull up the S&P 500. M2 went down, interest rates went up, the feds pulled their lever, right? They started sucking or as they say, shredding cash. They're not literally shredding cash. They're just constricting the, uh, the percentage rates so that banks can't lend out as much. And so what happened is Feds pulled the lever, M2 supply, the chart I just showed you guys hit, and we started to see the value come back into more of a realistic target. And consequently, what happened to the stock market? It dropped as well. Well, now we're kind of sitting at this inflection point where we're still overvalued, but you can see that the trend is definitely into the downside. And so what I like to say, or what I would would what I glean in terms of information from this is the market is kind of priced to perfection, but not as bad as it was uh, during the pandemic. That was just like ridiculous money. Uh, that was the time that you wanted to sell everything is when all this money was in the market, whether it's a house, whether it's stocks uh, and so forth. Now we're kind of going into this new territory. The VIX is in a good position. So like, you know, people are still buying. That's why it's still overvalued. But as soon as that VIX starts to kick up, you start to see like those 20s, 30 uh, targets on the VIX. I would guess that you're going to see the value start to come down and you're also going to see the market uh, come down with that. There's really just no other way to do this. Now, GDP has been going up over the last uh, couple months. In fact, we saw a spike in GDP and you can see where this happened here in July where GDP went way up and it helped, or excuse me, GDP went down while prices rose. So the stock market started going up, GDP started going down, and so the overvalued started kicking back in. Well, GDP has started coming up while the market is still really high. And I don't know if you guys have seen that, but the market, generally speaking, is pretty high, but GDP has been coming up, which we saw, I mean, even the Black Friday reports, Cyber Monday reports are showing us that like we're seeing more coming out of the market. Companies are becoming more profitable than they were months ago. And we're also seeing uh, sentiment. The public is starting to pull their cash out and say, yeah, we're not that worried about next year. We're going to start investing. Now, don't hold your breath on that. This is all <laughs> obviously information that can change very quick. But that is the sentiment and kind of the read from this indicator today. Now, I want to go into a section of this that I normally don't. And I know we're getting close on time, but I want to talk to you about yield curve. Since we were talking about uh, Ray Dalio's inflection point and how it was, it's tied to T-bonds, how we're watching bond prices really close, 
Because if someone's not willing to to buy a bond with the rate of return because inflation's too high, then we're going to have a problem, right? And so I want to show you this same website, by the way, guys, this is current market valuation. I love this site. Um, here is the yield curve inversion. And to give you, I'm just going to read through this to give you uh, what the yield curve inversion chart is and what it helps us predict. Because the yield curve inversion suggests the risk of a U.S. recession. And as you can see, everything's in red on this uh, site right now. And the yield curve inversion, according to current market valuation, is very high. Not kind of high, very high. And so the I'll just read this. The U.S. yield curve uh, is currently inverted, meaning short-term interest rates are higher than long-term interest rates. This usually, or this usual occurrence called a yield curve inversion has historically been a very reliable indicator of an upcoming economic recession. In fact, I think someone said that this has been so accurate uh, that it's predicted like every recession except for one. So like there's been like one time in the history of us like tracking the yield curve inversion that when this went into the certain territory that it was actually wrong. And so just look at this. I'm going to bring up the chart now. I just want to show you this. And just so you're aware, every gray line is a recession. So every time you see that little gray spot was actually when we were in a uh, documented recession. I, and I kind of put that in quotes because a lot of people are like, it feels like a recession already. It feels like this whole last year has been a recession. It's like, I get that. Inflation kind of is that hidden recession. But until inflation drops off, you're not going to see the numbers actually click in that show us that we're in a real recession. Why? Because inflation is kind of padding the numbers right now. But just going back, guys, look at 1970. You can see here that we had this moment where we went above the inversion chart, this, this kind of red and yellow section. And anytime we went over this, what did we have after a recession? And you can see it uh, late or early 70s. This was uh, 73. We broke through. What happened? A long recession after that. In the 80s, right around the time I was born, we had two moments where we went through recessions. But this was that time where we were going through like radical interest rate heights and declines. The feds didn't have all the data that they have today to kind of uh, bring the plane down to a soft landing, at least as well as they're doing now. Uh, so we were kind of going through these massive inflections and uh, points of uh, recession. But you can see clearly recession after it jumped over this level, recession again after it jumped over this level. Uh, then you can see in the 90s, again, same thing. We had the breakout. This one took, let's see how long it took from the break. 89 to 90. So it was a good almost a year that this one took before it finally hit. You can see the break out here on uh, July. 2000 we had the recession in 2001 you can see the breakout in 2007 you guys remember that crash most of you were around for that the housing market bubble uh we broke out of that in 2006 by the way so this is what's so funny is the news won't report this stuff right they they, they don't like talking about like these patterns that happened because they want everyone to think everything's fine and and frankly we get bored of it we get bored of like talking about this data but it was 2006, by the way, when this broke last time. And it took uh, a year and a half before we started feeling that recession, right? 2007, 2008. You guys remember. We had it happen again here in uh, 2019. We had that kind of COVID moment and we had a very slim recession. And then we injected the economy with a ton of cash. And look at where we are today. I, I just do not see with the level that we're at, at this negative 1.88 high that we have just come off of, I do not see how we're not going into a longer term recession, not this kind of short tamed uh, recession. We're looking at probably something just based on the data. That's all I'm looking at is just this chart. You know, it's kind of hard to do this when we have multiple pieces, but just looking at this chart, I would say based on the pattern, it looks like we're going to be in a much longer term recession. And these recessions lasted from 2007. What was that? December, December, 2007, clear into June, 
of 2009. So you're talking two and a half years. And the same thing here. Uh, so that's how long this was. I was just giving you that space. So, but here's where we had those massive spikes, similar to what we're seeing over here on the right. And so 1970s, we had a spike that went into like the one point negative 1.4. We saw highs of negative 1.87, very similar, very similar to today. And these recessions lasted about a year and a half after. So I do not, based on the chart, I'm not seeing that we are coming out of this for a quick recession. This is not going to be like what happened during the pandemic where we just have like a little quarter or a couple months that we go into this. Uh, we're going to have to, we're going to have to buckle down and deal with our problem. And like Ray Dalio said, we cannot afford to print more money to keep this recession really tight. And the reason is, is we're at this turning point. We are at a critical moment for the dollar, a critical moment for this country, where if we and our elected officials don't screw their heads on straight in the future, we are going to have a major problem long term in this country and owning dollars, like having dollar be our denominator uh, that we do transactions through. So some would say this makes a strong argument for Bitcoin. Some people make a strong argument that uh, we need a CBDC. Uh, I'm going to let you guys kind of rest on that one since we're on uh, running out of time. I want to make sure we get into our trades. Let's jump into that. So I'm going to bring up our charts here on green chart. We're going to get our gold and silver trade reviewed. Let me see if I can find... Where that's sitting. Here we go. And I'm going to go through this as quickly as I can, but I think I'll be able to do a good job with the time we've got left. So gold. Gold has been fascinating. And today, I don't know how many of you guys are watching this, but we are in a breakthrough trend today. And this channel that we drew, this was two weeks ago, by the way. And these support levels were all two weeks ago. You guys can remember how we were talking about this trend line and that we'd have some soft resistance at that 2000, but how bear it, or excuse me, bullish I've been on gold and the data on gold has just been coming out more bullish, more bullish as the dollar. And we hear articles and, and news about de-dollarization. People are moving to strong assets. They're moving to things, especially during a recession, uh, looking for recession proof type asset classes. And frankly, owning stuff is a great way to pad yourself or secure yourself during a recession. And you get all these doomsdayer people, by the way, people that love gold or doomsdayers. They have their bunkers. They want their gold because they think the world's going to end. And I will t I will tell you that we went through this in 2008 where gold and silver spiked, uh, hit all-time record highs. People thought the world was going to end, so they wanted actual physical things they could trade for things did the world end? no did gold and silver drop after that yes and so just keep that all in mind the pattern the history we're likely to see something similar but i'm still uh quite bullish on gold and so let's just bring this into today so let's bring this up we're going to channel this up get this dialed in such a tight channel by the way Get rid of some of this noise. We pretty much nailed this. And I'll give you a sense of what's going on. We've broken this last support level uh, today. It's happened as we spoke. People are buying gold on a Friday. Uh, and that's actually not very typical, by the way, to see a, a spike like this. But you can see our, la our next support level goes clear back here, guys. Clear back. Our gold support goes clear back to... What is this? Last year? Five of last year? Oh, no. Sorry. This is a daily. So th this high hit in 5.3, or excuse me, 5. Yeah, 5.3. Then we had it happen again back here in 2.24. So we're talking, um, if you're looking at days, we could even do a monthly chart. But if you're looking at days, we're going clear back into uh, July, June, July this year. So we're encroaching on that high, and that happened clear back uh, this year. And so we are in a new channel. And after today, I don't, if this closes, and again, this is really key to watch. If this candle closes above this 2050 level, 
guys, I don't see it coming back down next week. There would have to be some major news. So I'm just going to bring this chart way up into the future. So we've got our channel breaking out into next week. You guys can take some screenshots of this in here in just a second. And then I'm going to draw some ellipses to kind of show where I think this is going. Obviously, this is going to be a prime target range inside of the channel. And then you're going to see a lot more support holding above this 2050 level uh, going forward. So I would say this is going to be your home next year, next uh, week for gold. So between 20 or 2076 and 2050, guys, is where it's happening. So we've had a break. It's happened right now. A trade that you could take into this is bullish. A lot of people don't like doing that. They get scared when you're at the high of the market. But frankly speaking, trade the trend, right? Again, not financial advice. Do your own homework. But trade the trend is one of the rules. Stay within your support and resistance levels. I see some real potential for a bull trade. And you don't want to set your target anywhere close to this 2076 level. You want to put your stop below the 2050 level. And then if it gets up to this 2076 level next week, there's a lot of sideways trading you can do. So you can trade it down when it gets up towards that top level. You can trade it up when it gets back down to this 2050 level. Obviously, use your tools, watch the news. Uh, but there is our gold uh, analysis for the week. And I'm going to mark this so that we know where we are next week. So we'll save that. I'll bring this up into the next week. Let's go into the S&P 500. And this, again, same charts, guys. These were charts I drew two weeks ago because we didn't we didn't do this last Friday, if you guys recall. And look at how well our support and resistance levels are, are working. And last week, it finally broke out of the channel. We probably would have caught that on Friday. Uh, let's get rid of this because this is old news. Get rid of some of these this noise here. And I would say that we are uh, kind of in the same place. In fact, the VIX being as low as it is, I would watch. I'd be cautious of a breakout above this twenty or this forty six hundred level on the S and P five hundred. But let me just draw this channel in really quick. This will give you guys a sense of the pressure that's going to build into Monday. And then I don't feel as confident about this analysis as I do my gold analysis. But this is where the price is going to want to stay uh, come Monday. I'm going to bring that into here. And then if you get a break, here's kind of what the trade should look like. If you get a break towards the downside, you've got lots of room. Lots of room, lots of air to breathe. You'd put your stop loss, obviously, above the 4,600 level, take profits, clear down into the these levels. Even maybe a 4,500 uh, target would be possible. And then a break up or a run up is going to depend on some really good news. I do not foresee strong movements up. So I'm going to draw a really thin line up here. But if we do have a break, I think it's going to be pretty thin. I would say this is a more likely scenario. Uh, we're going to probably have some up movement. We'll start beating the drum. Uh, our heads will start hitting the ceiling, so to speak. And we'll start crouching down and probably see some bearish movement into Monday, Tuesday. Obviously, all of this depends on the news. It's going to depend on what sentiment is. Uh, and so keep an eye on that into Monday and Tuesday. But from a technical standpoint exclusively, bearish looks like next week. Um, and you might get some strong plays. We might see some higher volatility kick in and so bigger candles. But these small candles are great for sideways trading, guys. Um, so obviously, play cautious with this. But there's our our S&P 500 review. And I'm going to just mark this also so we have it for next week. So that, wow, great timing. So that pretty much wraps up our uh, morning this morning, guys. Thanks so much for being on here. If you are on my YouTube channel or you follow me on TikTok, Instagram, uh, Twitter, you know, I'm, all, I'm on all the channels. Put, make sure you guys are putting your comments in on anything on this video or anything that I'm doing that you'd like some more feedback on. I create my content based on the feedback that I get. So this was created from you. So thank you for your participation. Thanks for the comments that you guys have given me. This has been uh, basically a reflection of what you wanted. So I hope it was helpful. Thanks for being on here today. And we'll see you same time, same place next week. But 
Next week, we're going to be going over the real estate market. And so I'll be doing my full real estate recap. And guys, the CRE market has gotten worse and it's starting to hit red states. In fact, my state that I live in here and now in Utah, we are starting to hear it. And I'm hearing it from the top guys uh, that own some of the largest brokerage firms uh, here in the state, uh, listing agents. And uh, yeah, it's it's happening. So there's some opportunity when there's problems, there's always opportunity. Uh, but also there might be some timing things that you'd want to be aware of if you're in the commercial real estate realm. Uh, and then we'll talk about residential also. So thanks for being on here. We'll see you same time, same place next week and stay safe, uh, especially with your